Is it? Is it? Listen, apply, become eh. Are you ready? Say uh. Uh. Say yeah. Yeah. Say boss. Wow. There you go. Hello, everybody. Good morning, folks. We're here again. Yes, as you know, my name is Ono. And I'm Debbie. We have someone. I like to describe him as our children's godfather. I like to also call him our children's uncle. Mm -hmm. The one who we should be willing to entrust in the care of our children. Well, mine is along that line, too. In this era where we have child rights actions, advocacy is going on. You expect that there are more women in this field and all, but we have men acting as covers, and one of those few men are, you know, is this person we have on. So should I on this? Should I on this? Yes, please. So we have Mr. Taiwo Akilami in the building. Good morning, Mr. Taiwo. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure to be here. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well because it's my strength, my shield, my popular. Taiwo Akilami is a lifetime change pilgrim who seeks change through knowledge, practices change through discipline, and disseminates change through his lived values. Also, a consultant to UNICEF on the Child Rights Act 2003. He's also assistant editor of the Nigeria Weekly Law Report 2001 and 2004. Are there any other things you need to know? Basically, I had a childhood that was troubled. Um, or let me say I never had childhood. Mm. Mm. Uh, I know you talk about childhood, there are five fundamental characteristics of childhood. The first one is curiosity. Any mm. you stay away from a child, we have 80% of childhood deaths. Mm. The second one is freedom. When you take freedom away from a child, you have 60% of childhood deaths. The third one is joy. When you take joy away from a child, you have 40% of childhood deaths. The fifth one, is uh, innocence. When you take innocence away from a child, you have twenty percent of child is left. Now the fifth one is creativity. When you take creativity away from a child, you have zero percent of child is left. And if you never have childhood, you can never have adulthood. Because you can't put something on nothing and expect it to stand. Adulthood is to be built on childhood. So when you lose this fundamental characteristics of childhood you cannot be a sound adult. And for the first 27 years of my life, I, you know, childhood was supposed to last between eight, eight, 0 and 18. Mm. I never had childhood. And uh, between 18 and 27, I had to continue in that mode until February 16, 1997, when I gave my life to Christ. Mm. When I tell you I gave my life to Christ, I'm not um, a preacher, I don't run a church, and I'm not trying to make what I follow your program. I'm just talking about what has worked for me. I mean, if you talk to a Buddhist, a Buddhist will talk to you about what has worked for him. Mm. So this is what has worked for me. And as I always say when I talk to people that this one that has worked for me, I highly recommend it. I can vouch for it. So basically, that was my background. Uh, I suffered immense abuse, not because my friends were wicked people, my friends were good people, but unfortunately they didn't know what it means to bring up children. Like many parents today try to bring up children. They don't understand that for you to bring up children, you have to understand three fundamental things. And number one, you need knowledge. Knowledge is what to do. Number two, you need skill. Skill is how to do it. Number three, you need attitude. Attitude is the fortitude to do that which you know you should do. Now, we don't have these three in place as a matter of necessity. I can say with oracular precision that you're going to abuse children once you don't have knowledge of what to do. You don't have skills of how to do it. You don't have attitude, the fortitude to do that which you do. You know what happens is that um, you are definitely going to abuse children. Mm -hmm. One of the things I found out is that you talked about three phases of your life. Can you please elaborate on those three? Uh, well, I said my life is divided into three seasons. Three seasons. Mm -hmm. Season one is a zero to eighteen, mm -hmm. where I suffered immense abuse. Um, there are four ways by which a child can be abused. Four. The first one is physical abuse. The second one is emotional abuse. The third one is uh, sexual abuse. The fourth one is neglect. I suffered all of them bountifully. I said my childhood was a bountiful harvest of 
abuse sex not my virginity at the age of six. Yeah. That was the year I started primary school and my mother would go to the market, leave me with this particular woman who was a neighbor yeah. and this woman would strip me naked and play with every part of my body, do with a six year old boy what a man should do with a woman. And before I knew it, my sexuality was awoken, before I knew it, I started having sexual relations with other children, before I knew it, I started having anal sex with another teenager, it's a big fan of the homosexuality. Yeah. Before I knew it, I have taken my father's little and to my father's bedroom and I've molested her sexually yeah. and I've won that to tell anybody. So so that was my childhood. I started smoking at the age of twelve, at the age of twelve years, that's the year I started secondary school. I started drinking much, much earlier because my father smoked and he drank. Yeah. And so my parents were not wicked people as I said. Uh, I told my story when I turned forty. I did a CD which I called SSS Stories, Senses and Souls. Yeah. So stories are my stories, senses are the things that are the physical that I've learned then stones are the instructions for people. So I documented that. That was my childhood. I never had one. All those things that I told you robbed took childhood away from me. The second season, age 18, 27, I began to live in the effect of my childhood abuse. I was not suffering from low self-esteem. I was suffering from low self no esteem. I wasn't even aware that I was existing. Two things governed my life. What I would drink and what I would eat. And what people would say, I wanted to be in everybody's good book. And so, if anybody smiled at me, I could faint, you know, because uh, somebody's smiling at me. When I got to year one in the university, I couldn't speak in class because I felt that to speak in class, if I missed what I wanted to say, was international embarrassment. Mm. Because uh, many times I knew what the lecturer wanted us to say, and many times I won't be able to say it when somebody said it. I was going to feel bad that, oh, it was an opportunity to shine, and I never took it. Mm. And so, I was in the students' union, everybody I thought I was strong, I was mighty, but I was suffering. I was dealing with issues. I was sucked on cigarettes in their hemp, I was sucked, sucked on masturbation, all kinds of things. My life was going down the drain. And so it was like that for uh, another nine years, 18 to 27. And at 27, something unique happened to me. I gave my life to Christ, and when I gave my life to Christ, uh, a week before I met uh, the gentleman called Pastor Kumishoyo, they had spoken to me about the need for me to give my life to Christ. I had to him, and then um, so later that week on Sunday in my room, I gave my life to Christ. And when I did, I called him. I, I saw him in school on Monday, and I saw him, and um, he took me to where I fellowship right now. I've been in that church since then till now, the founder of Life Church. That's where I worship. And um, the second teaching church, I don't know how they do it. I mean, God met my need in that place and made it, made it a place of destiny for me under the leadership of my pastor, Pastor Sam So that's the beginning of the third season. But that is season I've been in 18 years. God has helped me to be able to deal with the impact of my upbringing. Now, this is it. Uh, people say that it's not that my father did this or my father did that. You know, I began to say that change is an ever present possibility for anybody who's ready to take responsibility. Mm-hmm. Now, my prayer is not just me well. Yes, when they stand before God, they're going to give an account of how they risk me. When I stand before God, I'm going to give an account of how I risk myself. So I cannot continue to say my father did, my mother did, I'm beginning to and continue to live in that because at the end of the day, when I become an important, when I become irrelevant, when I cannot even find a place in the footnote of history, uh, the world is not going to excuse me on the basis of how my mother took me or my father took me. The world is not going to do that. Hitler was an abused child. He slaughtered 62 million people. That was 2.5% of the entire population of the world. Mm-hmm. And he was not forgiven. He has not won Nobel or put in the global hall of fame if there's anything like that. If they admit that that was an abused child, Amini was an abused child, Joseph Stalin was an abused child, all these people troubled our world. Mm-hmm. But the world did not take into confidence the fact that they were abused, mm-hmm. uh, which may be the hypocrisy of our world. But the foundational thing is that no matter how you were raised, a time comes when you must begin to raise yourself and you see, what I talk about today when I speak in churches, or I speak in schools and organizations and companies, is to talk about those principles that have applied in the last 18 years that have made a difference. I'm just a storyteller. I tell stories of my past, I tell stories of the intervention by God, and I tell stories of the fruits that have, that have still there often. I tell stories of the principles that have applied that have made a difference for me. And so basically that's it. Okay, thank you.
how would you be able to explain to us what Christ has done in your life? Let me start by saying that I don't know the kind of Christ you meet that does not transform your life. Mm. I have never attended any therapy. I was hooked on cigarettes, I was hooked on Indian hemp, I was hooked on all kinds of things. I was a sex addict, pornography, all the rest of it. Mm. All I had to offer was brokenness and shame. Mm. And it made something beautiful of my life. I read my Bible in seven, they look at James and John, uh, Peter and John at the story when they schooled me, they reckoned that they have been with Jesus. So mm. what happened to me simply was that I gave my life to Jesus. Uh, it became a permanent reference, reference point in my diary of change. And God connected me with mentors. Basically, I think I met Christ, I met his people. And I identified five fundamental principles you know, that have kept me and um, I found in Christ. You know, the one principle is you just need to love yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, your change will be under pressure. Uh, what will people say? But when you love yourself, you accept yourself, you know that there's nothing wrong with me as of today. Now, that makes change easy because anything that is not under pressure cannot be permanent. So it doesn't matter if around, it has to be that I am changing because I know I have a better promise to God uh, through Christ Jesus. And, and that's number one. Number two is the fact that I must not live in denial. Many people live in denial today. They are not ready to speak up. They are not ready to take a look at their past and tell themselves what actually happened to them. I took time to look into the nooks and crannies of my entire life. I stared at my past and I identified things that were wrong. You know, in my upbringing, I told myself the good and truth. If you deceive everybody, there's someone you must not deceive yourself. Because if you deceive yourself, you are going to limit yourself. Now, how do you identify your present and plan for your future? If a people that forgot their history dies, how much more a people that do not know their history? You need to know your history. Socialization is the father of psychology. The way you are socialized is going to determine your mindset. 80% of the personality of the child is from between a 2 and 6. You need to take a look at your past. Then number three, you need to take responsibility to lead your, to, to lead yourself. The second person you are going to lead is your family. Before you begin to lead your community. If you don't lead yourself, you can't lead your family. If you can't lead your family, you can't lead the community. So you must take responsibility. You don't make excuses, you take responsibility. I cannot continue to mourn. I decided to take responsibility. And the first thing is that you must recognize the requirement for healing. What do I need to do to get healing? Because note, the Bible says when a man is in Christ, the new creature, all things are passed away, everything has become new. But the truth is, what passed away for you is different from what has passed away for me. What has passed away for me is going to be my constant source of temptation. Because I've tasted it before. And the enemy has a way of bringing to you what has been your weakness before. I must identify what has passed away, and I must identify to ensure that they are permanently passed away. I will be tempted in that area. When I'm tempted in those areas, when I'm tempted in the area of sex, when I'm tempted to do things that are contrary, I don't feel condemned. That is temptation. And I refuse to be condemned because I understand the things that I must not do and the things that I will do. So I must recognize the requirement for healing. Number five is that I must submit my, I must subscribe to the healing process. It's one thing for me to recognize the requirement for healing. It's another thing for me to subscribe. Subscription means I want to read books. Subscription means I want to talk to a mentor. I want to listen to a DVD. I want to stay and understand who I am and where I'm coming from. The last one is you must now submit to the healing process. Let me tell you something. There are many people who are subscribers. Nigeria is a country of subscribers. That is why you see what people go for training. They put the certificate of the training in their office, but the training is not in them. They put the certificate of the training in their CV, but the CV is not in them. And many people who have said they have attended leadership program, this program, that program, but when you relate with them, we find that there's nothing like leadership in them. When do you submit? You submit when you allow the knowledge that you have to govern your behavior. If your knowledge cannot govern your behavior, is simply information. You are not ready for transformation. Mm-hmm. Information does not transform. What transforms is the true knowledge that you have that is tangible. So we also like to shed some light to other things. Um, child watching language. Yeah, my wife. What can I say about?
got my wife and I have been in Christ. I got married at age of 26. And uh, so, in my last class, I did it in 74. I did my wife for two years. I did it for two years. And uh, so that's when I got time to get on my class to do some things. So, when we were meeting, I brought everything in the world to say, this one needs used to be the one that I got. And she got a problem with it. She believes that there's a future, that she sees there's a person that is worth investing in. And so, we took up the relationship nine years ago to be married. God has been faithfully keeping us. Uh, we have not experienced one. I love that man. Uh, we have not experienced one standard. And we are doing it. By the grace of God, we are not going to. Because um, my one strength is my glory. It's my gain. And uh, our weaknesses have become my own ministry. You know, as I'm by the side. Uh, we know Elias where I'm strong, and when I'm speaking in that area, she listens. And you know Elias where she's strong, when she's speaking in that area, I listen. For example, I, I don't think what I wear, you know, I'm not, I'm not fashion oriented, and I'm not to combine with us. But my wife is an expert at that. She, she knows, you know, before she goes out, I say, Lord, this is what I'm wearing, she gets place every chapter. out. Does it go with this? Does it go with that? She advises me. Now, she's from the upper cross. I mean, she's, she's been traveling on her life. She's born with silver spoon. Her father is a, is a double PhD. Uh, one of the things father uh, is in um, petroleum engineering. Um, so it's from the upper cross. I came from the village where I lived in a house in Mendoza where we never had toilet. <laughs> I never, I never should have driven to school one day. My wife was never driven to school. It's rather we to in school. But um, God has been able to bring us together because it's not about the bad that we do, it's about the values we yeah. begin to imbibe. You know, she's somebody who's a woman of value who, who looks beyond the background. When we got married, things were rough, things were tough. I was trying to do the things that I'm doing right now. And um, you know, it's not easy in this country to do something for yourself. Like, the mission has no plan for you. And uh, you have to do things together by yourself. And it's just tough, it's just rough. And particularly, uh, you are now in an area that people believe that you must be out of the mind. Uh, children, like, and so, uh, but what my wife always says that you still go to school. Uh, that is where you are supposed to be. For uh, one day, she you never know, discouraged me. She kept telling me, push, push, do what you have to do. And today, we are not where we want to be, but we are not where we used to be. Things are different, things are getting better, things are taking shape. Okay, wonderful. For someone who cares about children so much, you have any I don't have children yet. Okay. Now tell us about your academy. Number one, our academy is to bring to the very front of public consciousness and consciousness, the right and the responsibilities of the African child for due respect in the best interest of the child. We believe that the um, matter that has to do with children are swept under the carpet for children, and children are not seen, not to talk against them. And um, in this part of the world, a lot of people are raising children, are raising children by virtue of how they were raised. And they have never started out to take an account of how they were raised to see whether they were raised with anything to drive them about. And they tell you that I've become who I've become today because of the way I was raised. And I ask you, how were you raised? And what have you become for God's sake? And maybe you have become the president of this country. Is that the ultimate? Is that what you expect to be? What was the true potential? Have you been able to achieve it? So you need to learn about child. I began to learn about child in 2018 years ago when I did my life to cry. I began to learn everything that I have to try to do. I didn't experience it. I learned what I experienced was the opposite of how a child should not be treated. And so when I recognize how a child should not be treated, I began to understand how children should be treated. Over 200 people have passed through the academy. Right now we have over 300 people in the academy. Child protection advance is where we train people to be able to train our programs. We want to give them the franchise to our program. There are places we cannot get to. We need to democratize this process of helping people who are working with children, both at, at primary care devices, at the parents and guardians, and secondary care devices, schools, nannies, and everybody in the church of children with these things are not worn by virtue of age or by virtue of position or by virtue of what you wear. It's something that you have to study and you must study them, you have to sacrifice. The same way you sacrifice to do to study, to do courses in your, in your office because you want to excel. You know, you have to do that. But what we have found is that society has a fortitude of judging is successful. Success is only considered from the perspective of what you have achieved in terms of the 
projects you have met, mm. the places you have been, the you know, companies you have opened, the houses you have built, not understanding that the Ghanaian Proverbs say the wind of the nation begins in the homes of its people. So also the prosperity of the homes of the people begins in the homes of its people. So family comes first. Family is number one. Now let me tell you, there are four wings of protection. The first one is the family. The second one is the community. The third one now in the community you have the church, you have the school, you have the media, you have your neighbor, that's in the community. Then you have the state. Now you have the international community. Now let me tell you. The international community cannot play the role of the state. The state cannot play the role of the community. Community cannot play the role of the family. Now know that the family is number one in that order, number one. That is why if you are looking for a good school, if your definition of a good school is a school where you take your child and you ask up, there is no such school. Mm. The only good school that I know is that parents will be 30%, the school will be 70%. Any school that is set up, that is promising parents, that I can raise your children without you, is the set up for failure. Because it does not have capacity by nature and the arrangement of faith to be able to do that. Now, because the child will be hearing one voice. When the child does not hear one voice, the child becomes confused. The child is with you. You tell the child that pornography is not good. The child goes to another house. They don't have the age limit. They just watching anything. You know, and the child is watching it. And the child is growing up. A lot of confusion is in the mind of the child. And the child is thinking, do you rise? Do you not rise? So the child says, if it's free thing, the child says, when you go to home, you become a behave like a woman. So the child becomes a sissy person. You know, he's never, never have his time. He's never here not there. So you send the child abroad, you say, okay, go to school, you meet some people who say they are homosexuality or lesbianism, before it begins to, to join. ISIS is already a good people from Nigeria. But when you label the child, that the child talks to, what is going to happen? The day the child needs to speak up, when somebody is touching a private part, when somebody is trying to connect her, she's going to keep quiet because you are afraid that the child talks too much. And so, we tell parents that are three things you can commit against the destiny of the child. Three. The number one thing you can commit is the sin of silence. You can the you lose it, the promotion in the office. You can run the boat when somebody tries to hit your car on the road. You can run the boat when your landlord did not give, from, give you the thing to come to you. But when it comes to you, they will know what to run the boat. There's no war that children are not casualty for terrorists. In the history of humanity, there's no war that has been fought because of children. Then the second thing is sin of fire. And we don't believe that by virtue of the father, you are not no more than the child. I am your father. I'm your teacher. I, I know most. No, no, you don't. Because you see, you are not the one living in this world today. You are not living in this world at the environment where the child is living. If you must help the child, you must learn of the child. Then you must not learn from the child. Learning of the child means you are going to read about the child. You are going to study about the child. You are going to look at the societies about the child. And with the knowledge of the child, you will not go and learn from the child. Because the knowledge of the child will help you to interpret learning from the child. You are able to understand what the child is doing. You know, I, I study them, I ask them questions. I am intrigued by this personality for children. They are very interested, smart. I am smarter than the world is able to give them credit. And that is why we cannot see that yet. You know, the first thing we commit is giving the child is the sin of labor. We need their children. And most of the time, we labor them according to what we are found to be their weakness. What we call their weakness is, you know, you talk too much. You cannot talk. You are slow. You are retarded. As you are saying, the child is spoken again. One of the things that children look for is identity. So when you give back your child, you call your child on a lap I mean, you call your child, you do why with the man. The said, that's the name you call the child when you are, then you were happy. But that name does not have any meaning until you treat the child according to the tenets and the values of that name. Now, but as time goes by, you begin to call the child. Your own joy is that that's not the name I gave him. Because the day I gave him name, I brought, I brought oil, I brought adu, I brought sugar. I brought all these things. So those are the things that give a child a name. No, sugar and all those things are just symbols. The real thing that gives a child is or that gives a child in identity is the voice of authority in the life of the child. So you say the child is a fool. No, very soon the child will begin to behave like a fool. Very, very so how can we guide entertainment and media in the development of the child? We did an extensive research into the media. Okay. And because we know that media is the in the world. Strong media is a strong force. So media is not underrated. And everybody has become a publisher today with a Twitter handle, there are some followership, with your text messages, and the rest of it. Um, but the foundational thing again is that uh, children are. Uh, uh, when you look at nature, you understand what God is trying to do. Now, do you think it doesn't cost God anything for children to be falling from the sky? That they could have fallen from the sky and fall into 
experience in somewhere. So, but for the fact that God brought them through a man and a woman, it's a sign that they are supposed to be taken care of and guided by their man and a woman. And so, so the family uh, needs to create a system, uh, we call it a uh, child protection system. In um, the media, child and the media, we did statistics of, of how media, what media is doing to children and how parents can cancel. And for you to be any of this, you need time. I mean, if you are run away parents, and please know that an orphan is very childish things are dead. Mm-hmm. An orphan is a childish things are not only dead or alive. And so, so you find out that you cannot, and the placard that children are carrying out today is a vacancy. His parents apply with them. And the people are married, and say, under the same roof, they live together. But one of them is the only one parenting the child, because the other one does not have time to sleep with men, they don't have time, they have to say they have to move bread and the next one. So, the foundational thing is that, since such as now so much, that the children don't want what to regulate, they want what to work. It's only time. They don't want what to regulate, they want what to work. So, whatever you don't want your children to watch, you don't want. What you want is your children to watch. So, there's family time, TV. So, what are the things you want to watch? So, the kind of life I live today is that I believe that my value to take everything I do, including what I do, including what I do. I cannot say I want to have, I want to enjoy myself today. I'm going to see that in Kalash Pine, I'm smoking the other. Now, there was a time I was doing that because my value admitted it. I cannot say I want to look at women dancing, I want to look at women, look at women dancing. Whatever I do, my value is the and let me tell you something, value is stronger than will. People think will is strong, will is very strong, the will of man is very strong, but value is the governor of will. Because the book that I read says, a man who has no will over his spirit is like a city without war. The Bible is written in context, like it's written. In the days when Bible was written, every city was surrounded by walls. Every city. You read the story of the wall of Jericho, you read the story of, of I, and all these, all these cities, they were surrounded by walls. So so the writer Solomon was writing and was looking at those cities that, that are without war. He was saying that they were open to enemies, they were open to all kinds of attacks. And that is why you find that a city without a, 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 a person without rule over spirit. So if you have children, you want to raise those children along the line of your values. So you want to decide what your children are going to want, what they are going to want. You want to decide whether you want to see what you are going to expose your children to before you expose them to this. And so those are basic things that is important. Now we cannot emphasize the fact that our society is forced. We cannot emphasize the fact that things are gone here wire. We cannot emphasize the fact that parents today allow their children to listen to music that has no bearing. Yeah, I check my bag, check my bag for me, or give you food and the rest of it. That's saying that it is not right for schools to be played for children at that content. Yes, why, can I, why should I bring to my house poison? And I'm not giving all my effort to guide my children from eating poison. That's the best thing would have been that I shouldn't bring poison to my house in the first instance. By virtue of my value. So, the best thing would have been for people to come together and say, no, let us buy only what we need. And let it, if it's only one channel that I want to buy, let me do pay as we go and let me buy that channel. And let me watch that channel. Instead of bringing a bundle of distractions to my house and I'm being open that my children will not stay. Mm, that's a fantastic step. So I think that husband and wife should come together. First, determine how many children they want to have. Determine after that, how do you want to raise these children? Now, also determine, first of all, what does it mean to raise children? Uh, what is our position about divorce, finances? All those things will be stated in the family position. On the final note, what I would like to say is that, please, I want you to know that uh, uh, a child has to go anywhere in the world, in, in Lagos, in Abuja, in Benin, during the election, after the election, in, in Yemen, in America, in uh, London, in the uh, UAE, uh, uh, a child has only one problem. In Sabon Sabon, in Lugu, in Banana Island, in Lego, in Yomo, all of it. A child has only one problem. The only problem a child has is the ignorance of those who are living in. A child doesn't have two problems. So, any time you see a child not fulfilling destiny, not being protected, check out the ignorance of those who are living in the child. Then, lastly, there are two kinds of people in the life of the child. You can't find the third one. Only two kinds of people in the life of the child. The first one, any time you appear before a child, like in one of these categories, the first one is those who are part of the child's solution, the second one is those who are part of the child's problem. The question you must ask the first step for every point of time, are you part of that problem? Are you part of that solution? You must understand that the children are the pivotal link between today and tomorrow. You need children from the solution to see tomorrow. Now, there's no better way to end our world. You don't need blood, you don't need all these things anymore. You don't need to stop having children. You don't have to develop the people right now will die off, and that will be the end of this world. So you understand that children are the pivotal link between today and tomorrow. 
you are going to pay attention to them. By then you are regarding the future, you are guiding the person. And that's why you say, when you sing the child, you think to them, then you sing the future. In just one thought, when you sing the child, you are thinking to them. Because you are laying the foundation for tomorrow. When you think to the child, you are thinking the future. Because the child is an embodiment of today and tomorrow. The children are not leaders of tomorrow. Please note, children are leaders of today. Because leadership simply is not ready to take responsibility. When does the child take responsibility? The child takes responsibility for the moon. When the child is born and the child comes to this world, he's going to cry out, wah, 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 I'm here, don't bury me, I'm alive. That is responsibility. And when the child needs you to carry him or her, no matter how deep you are sleeping, when a child wants you to carry him or her, this is called child stimulation. The child needs you, the child will wake you up, the child will cry, you will wake up. Do you know body will sleep in their apartment? So you have to carry the child. He will let you know that I need to be breastfed now. That is responsibility when the child begins to grow up. He says, God, take this remote control. Go and put it in that place. That is responsibility. When they go to school, you are them class prefer. That is responsibility when you give them to those who say children are leaders of tomorrow and say, Go and appoint children as your prefect or your father. Go and appoint children because these children are supposed to be to us. That is the problem of our nation. We tell our children are leaders of tomorrow and leaders of tomorrow. We don't let them know that they are already leaders of today, playing the role of leadership right now. And it is that as they grow up in life, the kind of leadership they are going to be playing is going to be different. A child might be encouraging another one. That is a role of leadership. A child might protect another one. That is a role of leadership. Thank you very much, Mr. Taiwa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm the man I like to call principal, Taiwa Akilami. Thank you also, my co-host, Debbie, for being here. So, guys, this is all for today. Watch out for the next episode. God bless you.